Revelation chapter 2, we're going to pick it up in verse 8, where we left off. And as you're making your way there, let me introduce it. So it was the year 2000, I went on a missions trip, and uh, we were going uh, to, uh, to Indonesia. Indonesia is the largest archipelago in the world. There's 10,000 islands that make up the nation. We were going to the islands of Lombok, Sumba, and Sumbawa. And uh, just to give you a taste of these islands, it's like 90% Muslim. So a real friendly, welcoming place for Christians. Uh, I'm being sarcastic, obviously it's not. But we went there to minister, uh, and, uh, and just God doing a neat work. And the meeting at random collections of churches, as, as you might imagine, many of them just sort of underground sort of churches, small gatherings of Christians here and there. Um, I actually, on the island of Sumba, had the opportunity to preach to a group of about 150 people, uh, which is just gargantuan in terms of Indonesia. And so I'm preaching to them about God's grace. Uh, this particular collection of, of folks, had those that were, many of them Christians, but uh, predominantly come from sort of a legalistic tradition. So I was teaching about, you know, the gospel of grace. And to illustrate my point, I was using an illustration about uh, about uh, sailing in a ship. To get to Sumba, we actually had to take a, um, a ferry. And uh, in fact, many of the people that were in, were in this particular assembly of people were natives, but they, but they traveled in every day on this ferry to get there. And so I used that as an illustration. I said, you know, what happens if you take this ferry and the thing sinks on the way over here? You know, you, 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 some of y'all, you're going to drown right away if that happens. Some of you, maybe you can swim, but, you know, you, you only make it 100 yards off of the pier here. What, what's the difference between, between you? you? You both drowned. And I use that to sort of illustrate the, the futility of trying to earn a right standing with God in our own effort and so on. And, you know, some of you are better than others, but, you know, we all fall short. We need a Savior and so on. Well, what I didn't know as I'm telling this story is that Indonesians can't swim, and they're deathly afraid of water. So I gave the altar call, and 150 people just came <laughs> running forward. It was, it was a good time, let's just say that. So um, the morning that I left, I had just finished preaching in another church, and I decided I was going to go for a walk on the beach. And I went for a walk on the beach, and I ran into three Muslim young men. And I began to share the gospel with them, and one of them was really becoming angry, and he gets in my face, and he's telling me, there's no God but Allah. And, and I told him, listen, the Bible says there's, there's no other name given among, under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, I look at it in hindsight. I'm thinking I'm on this lonely, deserted beach with these three Muslims. They could have they killed me. But uh, thank you, Lord, you just gave me boldness in the, in the moment. I would have I'd loved to be able to tell the story that I led him to Christ. I didn't, but I just shared the gospel with him. And I tried to do as lovingly as I could. But at any rate, I, you know, I, end up, I, go, I end up going home. And I, I get a message after I get home that the following Sunday after I left at 8 o'clock in the morning, a mob of Muslims burned down the church that I had preached in. And they burned down 10 other churches and five people tragically were killed. Persecution. That's what we're going to talk about today. Christian persecution. Would it shock you to learn that worldwide over 100,000 Christians are killed for their faith every single year? According to the Center for Study of Global Christianity, from the year that the church was first planted, about 30 AD, until the year 2000, 70 million Christians have been killed, in their estimation, for the faith. And, and amazingly, 45 million of those have been killed in the 20th and 21st century. 45 million. They estimate that one Christian is killed every five minutes. To put that in perspective for you, that would mean that statistically, since we started our church service today, five Christians have been martyred for their faith, have been killed for their faith. Jesus told his disciples this. He said, you will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. 
That, if I had to pick one verse, which was the, the, the big idea of the, the section of text we're in, that would be it. That's exactly where we're at here. We're going to look at the church of Smyrna, persecuted church, as we're looking at the seven churches of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2, pick it up in verse 8. Jesus speaking, he says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. It's it's interesting. Smyrna, we talked about the church of Ephesus last week. Ephesus, the city of Ephesus, very rich, very opulent city. Uh, It was was known as the the jewel of of, of Asia. Uh, Well, Smyrna is the, the same way. This city is a rival city to Ephesus in terms of grandeur and opulence, but the Christians there are very poor, and we'll look at that more as we get into it. But Jesus says, look, I know your poverty, but you're rich. You are rich in what matters is what he means. And he says, and I know the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Yippee, right? Don't you love it when Jesus tells you these things? But this is what he says, and he says that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life, he who has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, Jesus here, he's continuing his message to the seven churches of Asia. We began looking at this last week. His messages are based upon his assessment of their condition. And his assessment (coughs) is not just of their condition, but it's of our condition as well. Jesus, certainly speaking to these churches in the, in the, time frame of which he gave it 2,000 years ago, but the church is 2,000 years of age. And so when he gives these observations, when he makes these observations about these churches, well, the church is comprised of people. People are people wherever you go. And so there are lessons for us as he observes things in these different churches. The lessons are for us as well. And because he's God, and because he's actively involved in his church, which we saw last week that in fact he is, Well, Jesus reserves the right and the prerogative when he sees things in our life to call them out. And so he either, because he's God, says, hey, look, there's areas that you need to be encouraged in. You're doing well. You need to keep doing well in this. Or, hey, there's some areas where you need to be corrected. And so this is what we're seeing here. Now, the unique thing about this church in Smyrna as we continue is that this is only one of two churches of the seven that he talks to that he has no words of correction for. Jesus' words for this church, this church Smyrna, they are only words of encouragement. Why? Well, because the church in Smyrna at this time is enduring intense persecution. It is a persecution that that we can scarcely imagine. And their name says it all, Smyrna. If you wanted to circle that in your Bibles nearby, you could write the word myrrh, M-Y-R-R-H, myrrh. Myrrh literally means bitter, but what myrrh actually it was at this time, it was a, a perfume, and it was a perfume that was used predominantly associated with death. It was, it was as a, a, a burial ointment that they would put on those that had died. And it's very telling the way that, that, you, that you produce myrrh. Myrrh is produced, it's, it's made from a certain, certain leaves. And you take these leaves and, and you crush these leaves. And when these leaves are crushed, you extract from the, the leaf a, a, a fragrant, a fragrant uh, resin that comes out. And you can only access it by crushing the leaf. And just like crushing plant leaves to produce myrrh, at this time, Smyrna, church that derives its name from myrrh, is itself being crushed. It is, it is being crushed by the persecution of the Roman government. It's being crushed by the perjury uh, against them from the Jews. And they were being crushed by extreme poverty. We'll get into the details of that as we continue in just a few minutes. But 
what we're going to see is that this crushing that they're going through, Jesus tells them, and we read that, it's just the beginning. Hey, they've got a long road of crushing that's ahead of them. And let me just say this right now at this point. That when you teach a message on suffering and on being crushed, it's not the most popular message in the world, okay? But we need to hear it, and here's why. Point number one, you, if you're taking notes, you can write it down. Crushing is part of the Christian process. Crushing is part of the Christian process. Just as the perfume was extracted by crushing myrrh, the same applies to you and me. Here's what Jesus said about this. He's talking to his disciples in John chapter 16. And he said, in the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now that word tribulation that Jesus uses there in John's gospel, it means literally to be pressed to the point of crushing. And notice that Jesus says, you will be pressed to the point of crushing. Now, we as Christians like to hold on to promises in the Bible. We even like to frame them in posters or thing, you know, things that we put on our desk or uh, up on our mantle. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm more than an overcomer in Christ Jesus, you know, that kind of stuff. But we don't take promises like this and we don't frame them, you know. Hey, you, you will have tribulation. You will be crushed. But it's a promise. It's, it's an absolute fact. Jesus says, look, guarantee it, it's going to happen. Listen to what Paul said to the Corinthians. He said, we think you ought to know, as he's writing to the Corinthians, he says, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble that we went through in the province of Asia this same general region here. He says, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. Let me just ask you a candid question. Have you ever been crushed to the extent that you thought it was beyond your ability to endure? Can I just see an honest show of hands, right? So many of us have experienced this. This is Paul saying, I don't know, isn't it kind of sort of weirdly comforting to hear the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, say, I know what it is to be crushed to the point of being overwhelmed, thinking it's beyond my ability to endure. So this is what he says. He says, and we thought we would never live through it. He says, but thank God, this is what he goes on to say in the next chapter, but thank God he has made us his captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. And now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. He says in the next verse, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Did you catch that? What he says there. What he's saying is, look, God allowed me and my companions to be crushed to reveal the beautiful fragrance of Christ. Some of you today, you are being crushed. Some of you today, you know what it is to endure something to where you think, God, you tell me in your word, you won't give me more than I can handle. And this, I think, proves you wrong right here. I think I'm going through something that is beyond my ability to endure. Maybe even today, maybe you got here by the skin of your teeth. Maybe you're hanging on by a thread today. And yet what Paul is telling us, what Jesus affirms and what the message of the church of Smyrna affirms with with a big exclamation point is to say, listen, crushing produces sweet results. God knows what he's doing. There's a purpose for it. There's an intent in it. It's all part of the Christian process. Paul said this to the Ephesians. He said, walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us And gave himself up for us as a, here it is, fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, how did Jesus give himself up for us? On the cross. He endured the cross, despising its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus went to the cross, and he endured this. Why? Because it produces these sweet results. And this is what what Jesus went through for us. So... It's interesting for us to consider this as we think, you know, gosh, we, you know, God's word makes it clear we're going to be crushed. We're going to experience this hardship. We see Smyrna being crushed and we correlate Smyrna comes from myrrh and and all that. But you know where myrrh comes from? I said it comes from leaves. It comes from leaves from a tree. It is a picture of Jesus Christ. 
that, that this, this, this fragrance, this myrrh, it, it, it's, it, it's produced by crushing, it's associated with embalming. And listen, it makes several prominent appearances in the scriptures. We first see myrrh mentioned when the, when the wise men come to, uh, in the New Testament, we see it mentioned when the wise men come to, to present their gifts to Jesus. They bring gold, they bring frankincense, and they bring myrrh. Gold, symbolic of Jesus the king. It is a gift for a king. Frankincense, symbolic of Jesus the high priest. The high priest would go in and he would offer uh, prayers up for the, he would intercede for the people and, and in the offering up of prayers, he would burn frankincense, this incense that would go up. And so this is a gift for, the, for Jesus, our high priest, whoever lives, the Bible says, to make intercession for us right now at the right hand of the throne of God. But they also brought myrrh. Myrrh was, was this gift for Jesus the prophet. Because Jesus prophesied that he was coming to give his life as a ransom for many. And that he would die associated with his death and with his burial. <clears throat> and so we see the wise men bringing the gift of myrrh uh, at Jesus' birth. We also see that Nicodemus brought myrrh to embalm Jesus' body. Right when After he had died, Nicodemus shows up and he brings this myrrh. Now... Jesus received the myrrh that was offered by the, the, the wise men that came to him. Now, he's an infant. Obviously, he, he, you know, he's like, thanks, guys. You know, it's not like that. But he received that. It was, it was given to him. But in a sense, when you think of, the, of Nicodemus offering the myrrh, well, in a sense, it, that was not received by God. Why? Well, because when they showed up to, to anoint Jesus' body with this myrrh, he wasn't there. And, and the, the symbol here is that the bitter crushing was over. It was done. You, see, you read in Isaiah chapter 60, and it's a picture there prophetically of Jesus in his triumphant return, which is yet in our future, but the day is coming when Jesus is coming back as a conquering king. And what happens there, as you read in Isaiah 60, they offer him gold and they offer him frankincense, but they do not offer him myrrh. Why? Well, because death has passed. It no longer has a hold on him. And that's what Jesus reminds this church of here in our text. If you look there in verse 8, he says, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. In other words, Jesus says, listen, I was crushed. I was crucified on the cross. But the result is life, life eternal, life everlasting, life as a conqueror. And the idea for you and me here is that crushing, the crushing process is only for a season. It's only for a season. It's not going to last forever. And what we need to understand is that when God allows you to be crushed, when he allows me to be crushed, listen, it's to serve a great purpose. And it is to bring about an unimaginable harvest, a fragrant offering of Christ and a fragrant working of Christ. Jesus said this, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. It's been said when God calls a man, he bids him come and die. And so we go through a crushing process and maybe today you're being crushed and my exhortation to you would be let the Lord do his work in your life. Don't lose heart, don't lose hope, don't believe that he's abandoned you or forsaken you for a minute because he says I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. But the only way that he gets that sweet aroma of Christ out of us is to crush us. And so if you're being crushed today, you need to understand that God knows what he's doing. That crushing was promised from Jesus from the beginning. I mean, we, you know, so often you hear somebody, they're sharing the gospel and they, and, and, and they make it just sound like, you know, it's awesome. You know, I always joke, like a country western song played backwards. You know, you get your truck back and your dog back and your wife back and everything's, everything's just awesome. No, 
Not always. In fact, somebody just recently, I think they were telling my wife, they were saying basically everything was good in my life until I gave my life to the Lord. And then I started just hitting one thing after another. Yeah. Because crushing is prescribed. It's part of the Christian process. And so Jesus goes on to say in the next verse, he says, I know. Listen, I, look, I know. Verse 9, I know your works. Tribulation and poverty, but you're rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they're Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Second point, if you're taking notes, you can write it down. Jesus understands our crushing. Jesus understands our crushing. Now, here's what he tells the church in Samaria. First of all, he says, look, I know your tribulation. What was going on in Smyrna? And Smyrna, it's a Roman city. And the residents of Smyrna were absolutely in love with the emperor. Like they worshipped the emperor. And they were such, you know, uh, you know, people, Apple products. They, they you have people, they call them fanboys. It's like, you know, everything Apple, they can do no wrong. Smyrna thought that the Roman emperor could do no wrong. They were so in love and enamored with the, with the emperor that the story is told at one time, the, the, the word came to them that there was some Roman battle and that the Roman soldiers were cold on the battlefront and they took the very clothes off their back and sent it to them. And so they were very richly rewarded uh, from Rome, from the emperor, and so they were a favored city in many ways. And what happened is, is that... Um, this started off as a, just a voluntary thing that they did and it morphed over time and it became such that in Smyrna, emperor worship was demanded. And so what would happen is that you would uh, come to you know, live your life, to do business, to work, to whatever you were going to do, but it all had to start with you offering up a pinch of incense that you would burn in worship, and you had to say, Caesar is Lord. And so as you would do this, then you would receive a certificate, which basically was your, your all access pass to society. So you could, if you wanted to get a job, you had to produce the certificate. If you wanted to buy and sell in the market, you had to produce a certificate. You, you had, it all was predicated on, hey, Jesus is Lord. And it just didn't end there. If you would, or not Jesus is Lord, but, but Caesar is Lord. And if you wouldn't say Caesar is Lord, to get this all-access pass, listen, ultimately, they'd kill you. And Christians were being killed left and right. There was, there was just ongoing stuff that's going on. In fact, there's a guy by the name of Polycarp. And by the way, let me just give you a book recommendation. It's called Fox's Book of Martyrs. I think it's required reading for all Christians, in my humble opinion. It details about you know, just hundreds of years of, of Christian history where people died for their faith in Christ. And this time in particular, about a 300-year time frame during the church of Smyrna in particular, intense, brutal persecution. There was a guy by the name of Polycarp. He actually took the Apostle John's place in overseeing the church in Smyrna. And the way the story goes, the history of his death... Rome basically hunted him down. He was 86 years old. They, they found this guy and basically said, look, um, just come and sacrifice to, to, to Caesar, burn the incense, say Caesar is Lord, and we'll let you live. And he said, God has been so good to me for 86 years. Am I now going to betray the Lord? I'm not going to do it. And the Lord gave Polycarp a vision. Basically, you're going to burn. They're going to set you on fire. They're going to burn you to death. And this is exactly what happened to him. They brought him up and they, they tried to talk him out of it. They're like, dude, you're an old man. Just, and this guy, when the soldiers showed up to kill him, he made his people make him dinner. Like, oh, these guys are hungry. They've been searching for me. And just, let's feed him dinner. Let's take care of him. He was that kind of guy, just loving, 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 giving, giving. And these people feel bad that are going to kill him. They're like, come on, please, just a little pinch. Just to, he goes, I'm not going to do it. They're like, we're going to burn you up. He's like, well, let's get to it. So they set a fire, they throw him in there, and the fire doesn't get to him. Fire is burning like crazy, and he's not getting burned. And so one of the guys grabs a spear, and he, and he hits him with a spear, gets him in the arm, hits an artery, and the blood puts the fire out. 
And they're like, oh, dude, you got a second chance now. Come on, just burn this thing. He's like, no, I won't do it. They light the fire again. That's the way he dies. So Jesus says to this church, man, and he's not alone. They're killing Christians left and right like this. Some brutal persecution taking place. He goes, look, I know your tribulation. Secondly, Jesus says to him, look, I know your poverty. Now, the word that's used here for poverty, it's not, oh, man, I got more month than money. It's kind of difficult. I'm having difficulty making ends meet. It's not even, oh, I'm living on welfare and it's tough. No, it is abject poverty. And here's why they were living in abject poverty. Remember, Smyrna is a rich, very successful city. The money was just there to be had. But they were living in abject poverty. Why? Because they would not worship and say Caesar is Lord. So they would not have a certificate. So they would not be able to get a job to earn any money. They would confiscate the the little goods that they had. They could not even go in and buy food. They were living completely at the mercy of God and, and of men. They were absolutely impoverished. You know, and it's, it's interesting. It's not even, it doesn't even belong in the same zip code, but it's interesting when you see this whole idea, where did their poverty come from? It came from, hey, you, you, gotta, you gotta say Caesar is Lord. And I, I think about the, the Christian baker in, in Oregon and, and the, the judgment that came down, and basically... It's the same ingredients. They basically said, look, you want a business license? You have to say Caesar is Lord. And and if you're going to get a business license, then this is what you are are obligated to do. If you won't do that, we're going to take your money from you. They took $150,000 from a couple that would not say, metaphorically speaking, Caesar is Lord. So it's not that far of a stretch to understand this kind of persecution. And Jesus says, look, I know it. I know it. I've seen it. Well, the other thing that Jesus says he knows, he goes, look, I I know the blasphemy of the Jews. He goes, I know they say they're Jews, but they're not. They're a synagogue of Satan. And basically what he means by that is they're they're not behaving as as those that that truly are children of God. See, because what what the Jews would do, they would bear false witness against the Christians in the courts. They would perpetuate lies against the Christians in the community, and they would just simply attack them every chance that they got. And and what Jesus says, he says, look, I know. And when he says, I know, it's not just, hey, I see what you're going through. But listen, when Jesus says, I know, he's saying, listen, I know because I have been there myself. Isaiah the prophet says of Jesus that he was despised and rejected by men. That he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Jesus himself told us that he was poor. He said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And so when Jesus says that he knows their poverty, he knows, hey, their persecution, he knows the perjury of the Jews against them, Hey, it's because he endured all of those things himself. The Bible says that we know him by the fellowship of his sufferings. Pastor Joe Foch from Calvary, Philadelphia, tells a story about um, a gal that was going to his church and her husband became very ill with cancer and, and in fact, was dying. And her, her greatest grief and concern was not just that she was going to lose her husband but that her husband did not know the Lord Jesus as his Lord and Savior and that he was going to to die and go to hell and so she was just beside herself with with anguish and she just prayed and asked everyone she ran into to pray for her husband and miraculously her husband came to faith in Christ and and yes he went home but he went home to be with the Lord and so so the death was painful but it was not without hope well Another gal, later on, sometime down the road, her husband became ill. It was almost a mirror story of this first gal. So prayers and just asking everybody that he would be saved. And and on his deathbed, he surrendered his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Pastor Joe winds up at this second gal's house. He's there to minister to her. Her husband has died and he's offering his consolation. And he says, there comes a knock on the door, and it's the first gal. 
And he said, she walked in and he said, their eyes met and they ran into each other's arms. And that second gal just sobbing, sobbing, and the first gal just comforting her. And, and you know what the first gal was saying? I know. I know. For minutes, as she sobbed, she would just say, I know. I know. And that's what Jesus says here. He says, listen, I know. Paul wrote this to the Corinthians. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, And the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God comforting through our trials, through our experiences, they are not for naught. They are, they, they, are, they are not just because God is some malevolent being who has a, a, a magnifying glass and he wants to burn you like an ant just for his own amusement. No, it's because God is strategically working and moving and doing so that we might become the fragrance of Christ. Well, that brings us to the third and final point today, and that's this, that Christians must faithfully endure crushing without fear. Christians must faithfully endure crushing without fear. And I want you to notice here in these next two verses that Jesus does three things. He prepares them for more trials to come. And he promises them hope if they will endure. And he puts into perspective what's at stake. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, Do not fear, verse 10, any of those things which you are about to suffer Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. First of all, Jesus here prepares them for more trials to come. He says this, he, he, he says, the devil is about to throw some of y'all into prison. Now, at, at, you know, first there, I mean, there's a lot to say about that. First of all, you're like, well, that's comforting. Yes, it's comforting. We're going to see why in a minute. But it raises a question. Because, because Jesus says who it is. He says, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, which means... That the devil is about to throw some of you in prison. See, a lot of times, what happens, we as Christians, we endure temptation or we endure trial or hardship. And we want to say, oh, the devil is really messing with me. Oh, the devil is really tempting me. Oh, the devil is, and you know, I'm sorry, chances are it ain't the devil himself, okay? Because we give the devil far too much power and sometimes we, we ascribe to the devil the attributes that are only belonging to God. And so God is omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. The devil is not. And, and can I just tell you candidly that he probably has bigger fish to fry than you. Okay? So if you're being tempted, if you're being tried, it's probably not the devil himself. There is what I like to call the, the, an unholy trinity that operates in the world. There's the world system that we live in, a fallen system that just doesn't go well for Christians. Just be candid. There's your flesh, your sinful flesh. You're a sinner by nature and by choice. And so your sinful flesh does not always bode well for your Christian aspirations. Paul said, that that I want to do, I don't do. That that I don't want to do, that's what I do. I'm a wretched man who's going to save me from this body of death. And so... There's the world system, there's your flesh, and then there are demons at work. When Satan fell, a third of the angels fell with him, and so that's a lot of demons at work in the world. So if you are tempted, if you are tried, if you are persecuted, chances are very good it's one of those three. But there are biblical examples when it was Satan himself showing up. And and Peter is one of them. Jesus went to Peter. He's like, hey, Pete, guess what? Satan has asked for you to sift you like wheat. And you and I in that situation, we become incontinent right there. We just like <laughs> shake in our shoes. And, and we become a puddle, literally, you know, because, oh my gosh, the, the enemy's powerful enemy. Um, Job, Satan messed with him 
personally. He got a personal visit from Satan. So here, Jesus says, look, some of y'all, you're going to get thrown into prison, and it's going to be the devil that's at work that does it. Um, but Jesus here, he's preparing them for that. And he tells them, he goes, look, you're going to have tribulation 10 days. Now, there's a lot of different commentators that, that have different interpretations of what it means 10 days. Um, the Scottish theologian William Barclay says, well, this is just a normal Greek expression for a short time. And that what the Lord is saying is, look, you're going to have some pretty humdinger of a, of a trial, but it's only going to be for a short time. That could be it. Um, others say, no, this is a probable reference to 10 intense periods of persecution that are going to come against God and God's people uh, by 10 different Roman emperors. And there were, in fact, 10 different Roman emperors that, that persecuted the church. It started with Nero in 54 AD, and, and it ended with uh, Diocletian in 284 AD. And so there are those that say, okay, well, started in 54, in 54 AD, ended 284 AD. You know, you do the math, that's 230 years. You know, that's roughly, you know, 24 years for each person. There's 24 hours in a day. And so that's where they get the, the 10. Who knows? But what we know is that the Lord says, look, you're going to be persecuted. Um, and, uh, and it's going to be for 10 days. The the thing that we can take away is, look, however many days the persecution is, it's short in contrast to eternity, okay? And so if, if God prescribes whatever he prescribes in your life, look, this life that we live, the Bible says your life is a vapor. You're here for a little while and then you're gone. Life is a vapor. It goes quickly. Everybody told Brenda and I, hey, life's going to go quick. You enjoy your kids. It goes really quick. And we're up to here with diapers and, and everything. And we're thinking, it's not going quick enough. And now I got eight grandchildren. And I'm looking and I got more years in my rearview mirror than I have out my windshield. And I'm like, it goes quick, man. It goes quick. So <clears throat> 10 days, hey, it's short in light of eternity. And listen, Jesus prescribes these trials and he's preparing Smyrna for them. That's the thing. Is he saying, look, it's going to get bad. It's bad now. It's going to get bad. It's going to get worse before it gets better. But, but, he, but he's preparing them for this. And sometimes God does that. I shared with you guys recently for, for my wife, Brenda. God spoke to her at the beginning of this year. He says, guess what? I'm going to unravel you this year. And God, true to his word, he, he systematically began to unravel her. Her father getting, you know, losing his mind literally overnight. Dying in a very quick period of time, but it was just torturous and hard and bringing him home to our, to our house to die and, and having to go through all of that. And then, you know, all of her physical ailments in the middle of that, cancer and, and all of these things. And God just systematically doing this now, but here's what I want you to hear. God told her up front he was going to do this. See, because what happens is we, we can get into, to, to, you know, the hits just keep on coming and you're like... I, I'm going to lose heart. I'm going to lose hope. I'm going to lose my mind. I'm going to lose my faith. I'm, whatever. And God says, no, no, no. I'm telling you that this is going to happen. I'm telling you up front. Don't lose heart. You stay faithful to the end. I'm working. I'm, I'm doing. I'm, I, I told you what it was so you can get prepared for it. Just like, just like you know, he, he told uh, the, 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 the pastor the, of, the, of the church of Smyrna, listen, man, this, you're going to get burned alive. He told him ahead of time. Hey, this, this is going to go down in your life, Polycarp, so you can be ready for this. And maybe today, that's what God is speaking to you. You're going, oh. So you're telling me that what I'm going through right now might not go away tomorrow. No, it might not. It might not. But God does not want you to lose heart. And so he prepares them for the trials that are going to come. Secondly, to notice here in these verses, he promises them hope if they endure. He promises them hope if they endure. Jesus says there in verse 10, Do not fear, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now when Jesus says here, do not fear, literally the way that this is written in the Greek, it's stop being afraid. 
which implies what? <laughs> they were afraid. Well, and duh, I would be afraid too if I was going through the persecution that they were going through. So we can't blame them. But the Lord is telling them, hey, stop being afraid. Now, how do we do that? And maybe you're saying, I'm all ears right now because I've been going through it and I'm, I'm fearful, I'm afraid. How do I stop being afraid? Look again at verse 8. How does Jesus identify himself at the very beginning? That's our key. That's our, that's, our, that's our foundational anchor to how do I stop being afraid. He says, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. In other words, hey, look, Jesus chose this title to remind us that we serve a risen Lord who is victorious over Satan's sin and death. And death couldn't hold Jesus. And listen, it can't hold you as his child. Okay, death is not the end. It's the graduation for the believer. And so with that in mind, what happens here is, is he's, he's giving them promise. Look, there, there's a future. There's a hope. This world is not all there is. We, we eagerly are looking to a Savior who's coming from heaven. And Jesus says, look, I am, I am, I'm he who is and was and is to come. And, 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 and here I am. And you can cast all your cares upon me. Now, that, that, with that in mind, we go into the third thing that Jesus says. Here's what I close on. He says, he puts into perspective what's at stake. Notice there in verse 11, he says, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Look, the truth is that we're all going to die physically. Ain't nobody getting out alive. The World Health Organization has published life expectancies. It says men, 77 years, the average life expectancy in the U.S. Women, 82 years of age, average life, life expectancy. I do the math. I was 52 last May. I'm like, geez, I got 25 years left. I, I got kids that are older than that. Well, that's if I make it to the average life expectancy. Maybe I live a little longer. Maybe I get hit by a bus today. I don't know. Again, what's your life? It's a vapor. It's here for a little while, then it's gone. So, so there's no guarantees. Everybody's going to die physically. Death, taxes, all right? Take it to the bank. But the Bible says it's appointed unto man to die once. That's the guarantee. But after this, to judgment. And after you die, you will face judgment. Because we're all spiritual beings. We're physical, we're spiritual. Romans 8.10, Paul says this. He says, if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. In other words, you can't escape your, your, your appointment with physical death, but you can escape spiritual death. And that's what the Lord is saying here. He's saying, endure. Endure and you will be protected you won't be hurt by the second death. And so for us now, today, the rubber meets the road. What do we learn from the church in Smyrna? Here's what we learn. God is faithful. Sometimes he prescribes suffering, and he calls on us as Christians to endure through suffering because in a crushing of us, he's going to use it for good. Now let me throw out one final thing as I look at the clock, which tells me I don't have time to tell you this one final thing. So... Um, Myrrh, this perfume to embalm the dead, brought to Jesus by the wise men, brought to embalm his body by Nicodemus, we also see it show up in the scriptures where when Jesus was hanging on the cross, they took wine and they mixed it with myrrh and they stuck it on a sponge and they tried to give it to him and Jesus refused it. And what a lot of Christians do is that when we're being crushed, we look for something to escape that crushing. Uh, I, you know, I'll look to, to, to booze, I'll look to, to drugs, I'll look to Prozac, I'll look to, you know, self-help manual, I'll look to, you know, whatever it is that, that'll help me to escape this and we need to see then when it came to crushing, Jesus did not escape it. He refused it. He went through it. Why? Because he knew. 
what was going to be produced through his crushing. Today, I ask you the question, do you know what's going to be produced by your crushing? Because you can trust in the Lord for what he's doing and what he will do. Thank you.